Thank you for coming. I'm Barb Trish, director of the Rosenfield Program, and uh, I uh, want to say a few words about our, our guest today. John Price graduated from Grinnell College in 1960, and in the years since, he's led a distinguished life of public service, both in and out of the government. His contributions to the college have included service on the college's board of trustees. A history major at Grinnell, Mr. Price spent a semester studying at American University in Washington, D.C., which he credits as wetting his appetite for politics, an appetite that apparently has not receded. After Grinnell, Mr. Price attended Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar, and he was awarded a law degree from Harvard University. Today, he'll be talking about his time in the White House and about the policy concept of a universal basic income, very popular during the late 1960s and early 1970s, but as you all might know, um, recently it's gained traction in the U.S. and abroad. When the policy took root, Mr. Price had the perfect vantage point, serving as a special assistant to President Richard Nixon, and also as the second person in the role of executive secretary of the Council on Urban Affairs, a Nixon-era domestic policy innovation initially staffed by Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who John succeeded. I, for one, anticipate an interesting account of the origins of the guaranteed income proposal, one that might, surpri one that might surprise those of us whose knowledge of the Nixon years is dominated by either the cloud of his departure from the White House or his notable foreign policy achievements. Thank you, John, for taking the time to fill us in on what you saw up close. Thank you, Barb. Can all of you hear me with this device on? I noticed uh, just moments ago a northbound freight on the Emma St. L. And it puts me in mind of an incident my senior spring here at Grinnell in still in winter in 1960. And late at night, the last version of the Emmons St. L. passenger train service from Minneapolis to St. Louis was coming through Grinnell at lightning speed. And we actually went out, a group of us, and laid flares on the sides of the tracks. By now, it was a shade of its former glory. It had simply a combined car at the end with a pot-bellied stove in the middle and a few seats and mail room in the front. But we flagged it to a stop. We took coffee and donuts on board to the crew and the passengers. And that was the last run ever of the passenger train. I am institutional memory telling you about this. Uh, I also have institutional memory uh, telling you about a Rosenfield lecture, which I was a witness to, uh, maybe my second year at, uh, at Grinnell. And I had a wonderful, effervescent, enthusiastic young teacher in the economics department, Philip Thomas, Philip S. Thomas, who was teaching a course in labor economics, and I chose to take that. And the Rosenfield program was bringing into campus during that semester none other than John Kenneth Galbraith, the six foot four or six foot five inch uh, Harvard economist with an ego to match his altitude. <laughs> and so he came in, but Phil had prepared us earlier with a list of readings of John Kenneth Galbraith's works to get through and to think about asking questions of the great man. And so the first lecture concluded and I was sort of, you know, primed like an athlete at the starting gun of the track, and I raised my hand and I quoted to him two passages from a couple of his writings, which seemed to me to be contradictory. And I said, Professor Galbraith, I said, I read this and the other. I said, is there a contradiction here? And he said, great minds are entitled to contradictions. Next question. <laughs> Literally, okay? So after my talk, whatever quality it may be, I will welcome questions. <laughs> okay? And I want to thank Barb for her management of the program here. I see, I think Wayne is in the back, is he? Is her, one of her predecessors in managing the Rosenfield Project, and great work uh, by all of you. It's a wonderful thing for the campus to do, to pull in uh, 
speakers of greater or lesser experience <laughs> to talk to you folks. And I'm going to talk about, as, as Barb said, I'm going to talk about Richard Nixon and the bipartisan roots of universal basic income. Let me see what happened with the capitalism. <laughs> uh, we'll put it here for you. Uh, the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. That is Kohelet, Kohelet the preacher from the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. Switzerland, Bavaria, Italy, the United States. Just less than three years ago, the Swiss organized a national referendum on universal basic income in the Mountain Federation. It put to a vote the proposal for all adults to be paid an unconditional monthly income, whether they were at work or not. It was overwhelmingly rejected. Almost 77% of the entire population voted to defeat, 33% in favor. Last autumn, in state, that is, provincial elections in Germany, the Bavarian Christian Social Union leader running for minister president, running for re-election as minister president, ran in part on a proposal to offer a state universal basic income. The percentage by which his party won in the election dropped more than 10 percentage points from the prior election in 2013. This was doubtless due in large measure to the mess in Berlin over the grand coalition between the Social Democrats on the one hand and uh, his sister party, Angela Merkel's Christian Democratic Union there. And there was obviously some spillover into the Bavarian elections. Uh, nonetheless, the CSU leader in Bavaria tried to stem that erosion by making this highly unusual pledge for a conservative party member to make. It did not appear to work. In Italy, a year ago, enthusiasm for the UBI idea characterized the new coalition government of populist parties. They campaigned on the issue. They won. Unlike the Swiss referendum, where the specific issue was up for a vote and lost overwhelmingly, the UBI was but one of the reasons voters in Italy may have turned to the outs and put them in. Despite pressure sensed from the credit markets, as well as from the European Union, uh, about the, the finances and budgetary implications of implementing the UBI, the leadership of the Five Star Movement there, in particular, is still pushing for a grant for everyone. Scattered across the globe are spots of experimentation or even programs in place, sometimes municipal, sometimes at higher levels of government. Only last month, last March, the mayor of Newark, New Jersey, announced that his city will soon launch a pilot program of cash support. No news yet about its features, no news yet about its reach, no news yet about its cost. The history of proposals of variance on a universal basic income is instructive. A UBI <clears throat> is not something new under the sun, as Ecclesiastes would put it. Let us visit Daniel Patrick Moynihan's book on the politics of a guaranteed income. He was not only my boss for, for two of the most glorious and substantive fun-filled and combative years of my life, now 50 years back. He was an intellectually curious and disciplined, focused academic who was able to draw inferences from data which eluded most observers and which had crucial implications for social policy. And as George Will has said of Pat Moynihan, he wrote more books than most of his colleagues in the Senate probably ever read. <coughs> Yes, he was a public intellectual in politics, but the academic, combined with a boisterously, gloriously, often undisciplined, magnetic politician who held his United States Senate seat from New York for a remarkable 24 years. He's a cocktail which no bartender today could dream of and craft for us. Sad. In his book published in 1973, Moynihan sets the stage for The backdrop, backdrop to a policy of cash grants to families in 1969 was quite different from today's discussion. 
Today, some think there is a dystopian future in workplace of the future, with only a gig economy, no shared loyalty between employers and employees, no certainty of employment. Today, there is concern for the unmoored workers. Fifty years ago, the focus began as a critique of the existing welfare system. The welfare program was seen as providing perverse incentives to break up of families. If poverty was the concern, that existing welfare system only reached those families which were dependent, not all poor families, millions of whom were working poor. This connection to family poverty and family integrity were what Moynihan focused on. Family policy, if you will. He reflected on its history in Europe and the US. This is one hand. By mid 20th century, American liberalism had come to associate the idea of family policy, not just with political conservatism, but with Catholic conservatism. This was a fair enough reading of political history in 19th century Europe, but it responded even more to the rise of Catholic political power in the United States. A tentative assertion of Catholic social thought in which the family is seen as the basic social unity, in which their interests take priority over those of the marketplace, but also of the state and of the individual. One hand said that when Catholic clergy denounced doctrines of liberalism as they apply to family matters, what they had in mind was laissez-faire capitalism of the vintage of Jeremy Bentham. One hand again, that the enactment of the minimum wage and practically the entire corpus of equivalent social legislation was in large part due to Catholic legislators is something neither liberals nor Catholics nor Catholic liberals seem ever quite to understand. Deeply conversant with Catholic social policy and convinced of the central role of the family, Moynihan became the point person for a response to the linked problem of poverty and a flawed system of delivery of assistance to families with children. As early as his tenure in the Jack Kennedy Department of Labor, he fastened on a European model, which he embraced and promoted. The idea to which he gravitated was called the family allowance. Today, we would call it the universal basic income. In the early 1960s, the United States did not have a system of family allowances, a per capita grant for every family of parents and children in a society. Moynihan described its ancestry by observing the theory of family allowance developed in Europe as an accommodation of the social theory that holds it to be the responsibility of society to provide families with an adequate income, accommodation to the modern practice that gears wages to the productivity of the worker without regard to differing levels of need. A married man with five children can be said to need, and from the point of view of some social theory, to deserve more income than does a bachelor. The practice began in Europe under fairly conservative regimes, usually a pro-natalist policy encouraging the birth of more kids. Canada introduced family allowances during World War II Partly as a gesture to Catholic French Canadians, and it took hold and became highly popular. Fifty years ago this August, Republican President Richard Nixon announced he would replace the existing system of welfare, the Aid to Families with Dependent Children, or AFDC, program, which was from the Social Security Act of 1935. He would replace that with a family assistance plan, FAP, we called it. It was radical and was recognized by the press at the time as the most revolutionary change in social policy since FDR and the New Deal. Nixon's Family Assistance Plan, or FAP, was a universal basic income for families and children. It had one key distinction from the proposals of these five decades later, and from the European model, uh, which Moynihan had been seized of. Resources were to be targeted specifically on the alleviation of poverty. Cash grants were to go to families in poverty, whether dependent or with a wage earner working full time, but whose income was not sufficient, either because of the size of his family, the family, or the very low paid type of employment. 
The family was nonetheless still poor. It was not a system of payments to all individuals of all families. Bill Gates would not have received a cash grant under the Nixon proposal, nor would most of us. It is a crucial distinction to keep in mind as we look at the efforts now attracting attention. The Nixon plan would phase out cash grants as family income increased. This is called a negative income tax. As you earn more, you get less uh, support, less cash support. Nixon is still to this day the only American president to have proposed an income maintenance measure of this nature. What caused FAP to fail? It failed two reasons. First, because of the reflexive opposition by his longtime political foes on the left. They could not bring themselves to credit him with a meritorious and liberal proposal. They could not support his progressive social policy reform because of their distrust or even loathing of him. Second, it failed because of the opposition of his political foes on the right within his own party. The right wing had sought to sink Nixon in 1962 in his comeback effort after the 1960 loss running for president against Jack Kennedy. The right, with the GOP 1964 nomination of Barry Goldwater, shifted even further in opposition to the moderate Republican policies of a President Eisenhower and his Vice President Richard Nixon. Despite its crushing defeat that year in 1964, the hard right, as Nixon would later call it, continued to try to conquer the Republican Party. While libertarians liked Nixon's proposal for cash grants to the poor, and liberals should have, the emerging Reagan Republicans found it a perfect reason to attack Nixon and to try to drive out the moderate Republicans from the GOP and pull the GOP further to the right. In other words, at the crucial moment, as William Butler Yeats put it in his poem, The Second Coming, things fall apart. The center cannot hold. It is a cautionary tale. For those who agree with me that what Nixon put forward was the framework or starting point for the most aggressive effort to end poverty and economic insecurity for those most at risk, any contemporary discussion of a guaranteed income should be informed by what happened in 1969 and a couple of years after that with the Family Assistance Plan. Before he took office, uh, in the winter 1968 issue of the Public Interest, Patrick Moynihan had written an article, The Crisis in Welfare. And about that, he said, the nation is not likely to do anything much to change it. The irony and the inaccuracy of his forecast was due to the job Moynihan likely never envisioned he would have, working for a president he had not supported, and he worked for Bob Kennedy, and then Hubert Humphrey against Nixon, but Nixon hired him anyway, and the strategy they built together. As things turned out, early in 1969, President Nixon and he put the lie to that resigned tone of voice that he had held earlier in 68. The roots of the Nixon proposal on income maintenance were various. And candidly, one route was a tenacious but wholly unsuccessful drive over many years within the US government, bureaucracy, by Democratic staffers who were pushing a negative income tax. These career civil servants and lower level Democratic political appointees could not convince the Democratic Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare to bring the idea to the Lyndon Johnson White House. The Secretary was unwilling because Lyndon Johnson was unwilling to hear about it. Johnson had his poverty program, which was overwhelmingly to provide services to the poor, not cash to the poor. They tried for years, these Democratic staffers, tried for years, but the Democratic administration was tone deaf to their pleas. But the new Republican team in town was not tone deaf. Nixon was to fashion this initiative with the help of many of his more liberal Republican friends whom he had placed in relevant cabinet departments at the beginning of his administration. Notably, these included the secretary and the undersecretary and assistant secretary for policy, 
at the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. They were all Californians, two of them veterans of elected politics there. All were on the moderate side of a California party, which also hosted the John Birchers and those Orange County conservatives who had sought to inter Nixon during his 1962 quest of the California governorship. These Nixon appointees listened eagerly to the holdover staffers who had broken their picks trying to sell their Democratic departmental bosses in Johnson's White House on their income maintenance ideas. But the, the crucial player was Daniel Patrick Morgan, the New Deal Democrat who was hired from the Harvard-MIT Joint Center for Urban Studies by Richard Nixon to be his assistant for urban affairs. Republicans had largely voted against President Johnson's war on poverty in the Economic Opportunity Act of 1964. As I said before, the approach of the Johnson administration was to do services, and they also created advocacy funding <coughs> to ameliorate the conditions of the poor. Pat Moynihan himself had been a principal architect of the poverty program, the War on Poverty. He worked with Michael Harrington, a democratic socialist and author of a book called The Other America, Frank Mankiewicz, and Adam Yarmolinsky, who was a Bob Kennedy figure. In fact, these four cooked up the poverty program over spaghetti dinners after work in Moynihan's house. But Moynihan got indigestion, and he turned on. He came to question his own creation. As the poverty program geared up, he was offended, as were President Johnson and countless Democratic mayors of cities all over the country, who became the target of criticism and abuse funded by the government itself. But it was not just the anti-government advocacy which bothered William. More central to his concern about those in poverty, Moynihan witnessed generous incomes going to middle-class social workers and funding of consultancies which provided highly satisfactory incomes for the consultants. Where were the poor, he wondered. In a 1973 book, Coping on the Practice of Government, he headed one section, feeding the horse to nourish the sparrow. He spoke of former Democratic Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, Abraham Ribicoff, estimating there were 168 anti-poverty programs sponsored by the U.S. government, spending $31 billion per year. Ribicoff, by now a U.S. Senator, estimated that if just one-third of this, quote, was given directly to the poor, they would no longer be any poverty in the United States. Moynihan points out that during the 1960s, there was a sharp rise in the incomes of educated blacks. He presumes that much of that was due to blacks taking the jobs that go with providing services to the black poor. Still, it was not the poor who were getting the billions going into poverty programs. As we sit here, surrounded by pasture, cornfields, and barnyards, hear Moynihan's point. These programs are instances of that old technique, feed the horses to nourish the sparrows that are in the vicinity. The horses always found this plausible. You get the metaphor? I'm a farm boy in part. I understand what he's talking about. <laughs> Certain passes through intestinal tracts. And he, he turned, I'm sorry, I had to spell that out. <laughs> he turned to an income strategy which he successfully entreated Nixon to embrace. In the heat of the struggle for Nixon's decision, Moynihan left behind the European and the later Georgian governed type family allowance. He embraced and urged the new president to embrace a negative income tax. Here's Moynihan. For the longest time, we had been importers of ideas, as we had been importers of capital. The bold reform programs of the 30s and 40s and 50s and beyond. We are just, for example, now getting to health insurance than 50 years ago. Have consisted to a dispiriting degree of ideas Lloyd George borrowed from Bismarck. The family assistance plan was different. It was singularly an American idea and of recent origin. Winningham had for half a dozen years advocated what we would today call the universal basic income. But he and Nixon finally took, seemed then and would today, a more practical and effective path 
to reassuring struggling families with an income safety net. Nixon's dramatic reform and expansion of the food stamp program and his universal national health insurance proposals of 1971 were of a piece with this focus on jobs, income, and economic security for Americans at risk. Fact of the Family Assistance Plan was the centerpiece of this strategy. Moynihan, in turn, was helped to persuade Nixon due to plentiful Republican intellectual provenance for the proposal. Among them was the Ripon Society's contribution of detailed work on a negative income tax. Ripon was a Republican academically oriented group of which I was a founder while I was in law school in Boston. A partial genesis of Ripon's ideas was found in an important book by the Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman. Friedman was an influential figure at the University of Chicago from which George Shultz came to the Nixon administration as Secretary of Labor. Friedman's book in 1962, Capitalism and Freedom, proposed an income-tested payment for families to impose a floor on their income, the very idea that Moynihan was in the new administration to put in front of Nixon. Friedman enjoyed gilt-edged credentials on the right. He had served as the economics advisor to the 1964 presidential campaign of Barry Goldwater, who had routed the establishment and moderates within the Republican Party to win the Cal Palace nomination. Friedman had recently renewed his call for change from the current welfare system, where caseloads and costs were skyrocketing. And in a March 1967 issue of National Review, one of the premier publications on the conservative side of their movement, Friedman said the welfare system, quote, involves a tremendous bureaucracy, widespread intervention into the operation of the market system in areas that have nothing to do with poverty, and inexcusable interference with the individual freedom and dignity of the truly poor who receive assistance. He offered the negative income tax, the cash grant diminishing with increased earnings of a recipient as the right direction to take. Not a month later, the April 1967 issue of the Ripon Forum carried a six-page detailed proposal and argument for the NIT, negative income tax. Ripon invoked former Republican Senator Robert Taft's prescription that there should be a minimum income for American families, Taft, and urged that this should be, the Ripon Society urged this should be a cornerstone of an alternative to, Lind to Lyndon Johnson's war on poverty. Ripon's proposal of an NIT became the national debate topic the next year for university and college debate teams. The support of Bob Taft was extraordinary. As he had been the leader of the Republican Party in the U.S. Senate, he had sought the GOP presidential nomination twice against the liberal Republican governor of New York, Thomas Dewey, and as an isolationist only partially reformed, fought Dwight Eisenhower unsuccessfully in 1952 for the Republican nomination. His conservative credentials that were thus convinced. So a draft statute by Ripon members appeared in the Yale Law Journal, and the model statute was embraced for legislation by Republican Congressman Richard Whaley of Ohio. So this was a ready for action policy idea. Bob Taft was cited a year later upon the release of the report of the Kerner Commission, if any of you remember that, the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders after the Watts riots in California. It called for a national system of income supplementation to aid both the working poor and the dependent poor. As Moynihan observed in his politics of a guaranteed income, it invoked the thin-lipped integrity of former Republican Senator Robert A. Taft of Ohio who had, in 1949, proposed the federal government maintain a minimum standard floor under subsistence, that's a quote from Taft, so as to guarantee all Americans a, quote, minimum standard of decent living and all ch children a fair opportunity to get a start in life. <coughs> and just days before he, this is a personal anecdote, just days before he declared his candidacy for the 1968 presidential nomination, I was with Nixon on January 28th of, of 68 for a small dinner of seven or eight of us in New York. I suggested he take an interest in the negative income tax. I invoked the name of Milton Friedman as a philosophical conservative who saw it as a crucial element for social policy. In hindsight, I might have been less forceful 
in arguing as authority for the NIC's Friedman support. <laughs> Years later, and I've been going through the treasure trove of documents in the Nixon archives in California. Years later, in a conversation with John Ehrlichman, who was a key Nixon aide, the president exclaimed as Friedman's name came up, quote, I wish I were as sure about anything as Milton Friedman is about everything. <laughs> the point I made to Nixon that evening at the Lynx Club in Manhattan was that there was an intriguing convergence of conservative and liberal opinion on this idea. National Review, a conservative mouthpiece, had run the piece of Friedman's on the NIT, and on its heels came the extensive rip-on proposal, including the full draft statute. On the liberal side, in support were a number of Democratic economists, such as Joseph Peckman and James Tobin. As a political matter, I thought Friedman's persuasive arguments would help Nixon to explore a notion that was a radical departure from the current welfare social policy world and legislative structure. As Moynihan himself later noted in a lengthy discussion of Friedman's analysis of the grounds uh, for an impact of the negative income tax, Moynihan says, Friedman was a convinced and combative political conservative. One thing Nixon was certain of was that the current welfare system was flawed. Nixon was by no means ready to embrace a negative income tax program, even less so a guaranteed income. This nomenclature was possessed of some of the same third rail of politics as discussions of abolishing Social Security would have. And guaranteed income still would have a bit of that taboo today. One hand notes that, quote, the term guaranteed income had become ideologically charged. It had come to stand for the proposition that people ought not to have to work for a living. American public opinion has shown a persistent tendency to associate political radicalism with the abolition of the wage system, an essentially utopian ideal with bohemian disdain for the work ethic. Any president proposing a guaranteed income in those terms would press that button, and that would be the end of his proposal. But nothing required that a guaranteed income be called a guaranteed income. Guaranteed, in guaranteed income was the lone label that said poison. When the subterranean Democrats I referred to before in the bureaucracy came up with a formal proposal for approval by their new Republican secretary of AGW, Robert Finch, the politically astute Finch crowd immediately addressed the issue of nomenclature. As Assistant Secretary Lou Butler, who was from the Bay Area environmental lawyer, opened a meeting on March 3rd, 1969, for presentation of this welfare reform plan to the secretary, he entreated Finch, who had flipped already to the substantive part of the paper, to go back to the title page. And Finch did. The secretary went back to the title page. There, Finch read the title. Christian Working Man's Anti-Communist National Defense Rivers and Harbors Act of 1961. <laughs> I was going to hand staff person on the welfare issue. By now, I had gained the confidence of the departmental experts, partly because of my own partiality to the negative income tax idea. In turn, I sold Moynihan on it, and he relinquished his preference for the all-inclusive, grants-to-everyone, family allowance structure for a guaranteed income. A persuasive argument that I made was simply the sticker cost of a family allowance. This remains today one of the glaring political pitfalls for a universal basic income. If you give every single person a grant of anything, $500 a month, $1,000 a month, the cost of the nominal budget outlay is stupefying. It certainly would be in today's dollars, but it was so in 1969 as well. Conceptually, you could argue, most of the grants going to the more after will be taxed back at some level. However, tax brackets are now even lower than they were in 1969. Even then, the government would have recouped only a part of its outlay through taxation of those wealthy who received it. I told Moynihan the Republican Party would never brook an outlay of the amounts the family allowance program would require. Nor would most moderate Democrats, of which there were quite a few in important positions in 1969, including the folks running the Ways and Means Committee in the House and the Finance Committee in the Senate. They were conservative Democrats. Furthermore, the current welfare recipient organizations and lobbyists 
like the National Welfare Rights Organization, would not want the money going other than to their constituents, if it meant less of an increase for them. The Democrats were to be instructed on this point three years later. George McGovern, Democrat of South Dakota, won the Democratic nomination to oppose Richard Nixon in 1972. He proposed a generous universal basic income. Remember? It granted every person in the United States, regardless of their income and whether they were working or not, a thousand dollars per person per year. He called it a demo grant. He was then gobsmacked on this and other issues by Nixon. George McGovern suffered the worst defeat in the history of American presidential campaigns. He carried Massachusetts and the District of Columbia. He lost to Nixon by 520 electoral college votes to 17. He lost the popular vote by 47 million to 29 million. He said he wished he had never heard of a Democrat. What Nixon embraced was a negative income tax. It targeted those in poverty. It stood in stark contrast to the approach the Johnson administration had embraced in its war on poverty. Getting Nixon to it was not easy. And finally, sadly, only a part of it, the crucial part, was ever turned into law. The arguments which Nixon heard as he debated moving forward would likely seem fresh and relevant today. They are arguments of psychology, of human behavior, of motivation, of what the proper role of government is, of economics and priorities. <clears throat> what can government afford? And should it be allocated between needs? How should it be? even between basic human needs, and not just as between defense or infrastructure or human services? Should the many diverse, complicated programs to address poverty be collapsed together and cashed out or converted into cash grants in their place in the hands of the poor? Can the poor be trusted to spend cash wisely, or must they be supervised, protected by social workers, or by administrators of rental subsidies or providers of food stamps. The debate went on through the spring and into the summer of 69. Nixon finally made his decision. He lamented with Moynihan that he carried only three of his cabinet members with him. Like Lincoln, you know, what's the vote in my cabinet? Nine to one, I'm the one, the ayes have it. And, but Nixon finally forced it through with only three of them with him. He admitted to Moynihan that he had major doubts and that it was a heavy gamble on human nature. But he conceded he was willing to take the gamble because the current welfare system was such a failure. He started then with Moynihan to refer to our monument. After announcing his plan, Nixon had four of us in on a Saturday morning to the Oval Office. We were about to depart in two teams of two to crisscross the country meeting with editorial boards and doing radio and TV station interviews in support of the family assistance plan. Uh, as we came in, Nixon had his feet up on the desk and he looked up at us and he asked, so how does it feel to have your idea given birth to? I piped up immediately and I said, wonderful, and you made a wonderful midwife. But the early, overwhelmingly positive reception <coughs> turns to criticism and battling. <coughs> Both the right and the left mobilized in opposition. And neither Moynihan cajoling liberals nor the invocation of a Milton Friedman with the conservatives could save FAP. Excuse me, one Philosophical, <clears throat> fiscal, and purely political elements killed the first universal basic income ever offered by an American president. Before the final act played out a couple of years later, and in a, more, in a more hopeful vein was a conversation I had with the president. It was late in the afternoon on December 24th, 1969. It was Christmas Eve in the Oval Office. And I walked in bringing with me Dr. Jean Mayer, who was a professor at Tufts University. And Dr. Mayer had been the chairman of the White House Conference on Food, Nutrition, and Health. And he had under his arm the conference report and the recommendations formally to deliver them to President Nixon, who in turn was going to hand them to me for follow-up and implementation. We both sat directly in front of Nixon at his large desk with the windows behind him opening onto the White House lawn. 
Richard Nixon took the report from my ear, leaned back from the desk, and read the summary page before handing me the thick package and started starting to talk. We spoke for some while about the conference and the report. Neither the conference nor the report had been free of controversy. The issue of nutrition and hunger hung over the conversation. The fact that it was Christmas Eve and at the end of the afternoon made the mood all the more reflective. With the shadows lengthening on the lawn behind him and the slant of the sun pouring over his shoulders onto the desk, Dixon turned from Dr. Mayer and turned to me. He spoke of his landmark initiative, the Family Assistance Plan, and said that it was terribly important that we get family assistance passed. After a pause, with a thoughtful expression on his face, he said to me, of course, annually, the subject of raising the floor on this income support program will come up. Every year, most of the Republicans will vote against any increase, but it will be passed with mostly Democratic votes. It doesn't matter. He concluded by saying simply, the important thing is that we will establish the principle. It was not to be. Years later, in a letter to Daniel Patrick Moynihan, now a seasoned Democratic United States Senator from New York, Nixon wrote that, quote, it is a national tragedy that an unholy alliance of the far right and the left killed the fact. In hindsight, Moynihan believed <clears throat> the history of what became Nixon's family assistance plan says American government is potentially capable of fundamental social change. He thinks it will happen when those who talk change know more of what is involved and required. He quotes former Senator Edmund Muskie of Maine at a Liberal Party dinner in New York City in autumn 1971, that the blunt truth is that liberals have achieved virtually no fundamental change in our society since the end of the New Deal. One hand then asks, is this true? If so, why? <coughs> Is it possible that loud, even strident insistence on social change is becoming a mask for social privilege in America? The French have a phrase for it. Think left, live right. Is that what is happening? Is liberalism increasingly the property of a privileged class that really does not want change, that wants only the appearance of doing so? Such things happen. It can also happen that advocates of great change will oppose with rending passion any change they conceive to be insufficiently great and interpret as a device for putting off the apocalyptic day of final change, which is, of course, a persistent human vision. This, for certain, happens to the Family Assistance Plan. Its most passionate opponents were those who declared themselves in favor of more, not less, that is proposed. Let us hope that any contemporary discussion of the universal basic income is informed by the fiscal and political realities, but at the same time with deep concern for the welfare of those at the margins of income and opportunity. I vote once again to use the resources we have or can muster, not profligately to spread spending around to all, but to concentrate on those most in need to work harder at figuring out the nettlesome problems of meshing a cash program with the myriad programs in place, to figure out the way to honor the American public's desire for a work ethic. Nixon chose a work requirement, and many are opting for broadening that today. But again, I think it likely the American public would have an aversion to work requirements which are meaningless or punitive. Or should we accompany the cash program with a last resort employment? Even Richard Nixon considered this. We have a real-world example of fashioning public policy on these important issues. Let us pay attention to what we can learn. Thank you. John, yes, since sir. you knew Nixon pretty well and spent a lot of time trying to be persuasive with him, uh, how much did his own background of at least semi-poverty have to do with his attitude? I think a great deal. 
And he was a complicated guy. And, and, uh, <coughs> early on, in 1946, he became a member of the NAACP. And he was not without uh, breadth of, of uh, interest in politics. But he was, as the president, former president's question says, uh, he was up from, not grinding probably, but pretty close to it. He had two brothers who died of tuberculosis. They had no health insurance in those days. And so his mother took them in series as they were dying at different times to Arizona to a sanitarium. And she had to work by helping out other dying patients, or patients of tuberculosis, to pay for it. Nixon himself helped his father, who was pretty much a failure in anything he tried to do. His dad, for a while, was running a, a grocery store. And Nixon would, while in high school, get up when he had a driver's license uh, and go into Los Angeles at 4 o'clock every morning to bring uh, grocery goods for his father's store. He was accepted by Harvard College, but he had the money to go there. So he went to Whittier in California, where he managed to work it out. Uh, interestingly, Mrs. Moynihan, Elizabeth Brennan Moynihan, who's Pat's widow, is a dear friend. She's 88, she's a pistol. And I said, you know, tell me, did he and did Moynihan and Pat ever talk about their shared sort of background of that kind? Pat was, his dad walked away, left him when he was a boy, and he was, then had to go back to the Hell's Kitchen. His mother was a bartender. Pat was a stevedore on the docks. Uh, he said, nobody ever told me I should go to college. And uh, so they, they had something that linked them. And Mrs. Moynihan, when I put the question to her, she said, yes, she said it was, it was always there. They, they understood each other. They didn't talk a lot about it, but yes, it was there. So part of your part of the answer to your question is that. Uh, and so I think when it came to these issues, I mentioned the three big ones. The food stamps was the first one. Nixon took a, a checkered pattern of food stamp assistance from all over the country. He rationalized it. Pardon me. He made it a national program. He imposed uniform federal standards on the eligibility for food stamps on the levels of benefits. It had varied from county to county. Then the family assistance plan, which was the centerpiece, was his cash income maintenance program. And the third was his health insurance proposal, which was universal. Richard Nixon, 50 years ago, proposed coverage of pre-existing conditions. 50 years ago. Richard Nixon, 50 years ago, proposed prescription drug coverage for all patients. Medicare didn't see it again for how long? George, George W. Bush, right? So not until 2000. Nixon was proposing that in 1971. So he, he there, your point is on point. <laughs> I think that there was a visceral reaction. You even see it in the, the tone and the way in which his messages to Congress or his statements on these kinds of issues are written. Because he had a stable of speechwriters. They ranged from my old adversary and right-wing uh, Pat Buchanan to Raymond Price, who just passed away, who was an editorial page editor of the York Herald Tribune, who was, which was the liberal Republican House of Order, and in between. And so uh, I have from Nixon's own from notes, uh, Nixon talking about his speechwriters, trying to pick the right one to do the job. He said, Ray Price, too presidential. Pat Buchanan, too unpresidential. But, but on these issues, you know, he picked like Lee Heber, who was a co-founder of the Rip On Society, he was one of the publisher and CEO of the Herald Tribune in Paris, and he was a liberal Republican. <clears throat> Lee and I did the health insurance deal together in February of 71. The tone of it, Nixon approved it. It was not drafts were given to him, but he was the guy who put the final agreement on it. And the tone was different. It was much more uh, in keeping with what he was proposing. There was a connection to it. Long answer, but I hope it answers your question. Yes, sir. Well, I was wondering. Microphone coming. Um, I understand that this would necessarily be talking about things that have yet that have not happened, but assuming you have been able to get the family assistance plan through, yes. what were some anticipated economic fallouts of this? Because like you know probably would not be universally positive. Of course not. But uh, what it would have done was to, it would have abolished the AFDC program 
so we would have had a uniform eligibility program, uh, eligibility for income maintenance for the federal floor. The floor sounds lamentably low when you think about it in, 19, in 2019, but it was in effect $2,400 for a family for per year. But don't forget that was 50 years ago, so that was a lot more than it sounds this afternoon. Uh, so the, the other impact would have been fascinating in terms of demographics and geography because uh, the AFDC program, which had developed a powerful advocacy and constituency, was mostly, <coughs> frankly, mostly northern urban liberals, <coughs> and most of them were female-headed black families. And these were not all of the poor. But what the family assistance plan did was to say, we will address poverty, not people who are in certain conditions or situations or geographies. And so it in fact it in fact reached everybody at or below the poverty line, whether they were working full time or not. So it was it was a radical change and it would have had major economic development consequences. John Kane, who was at the time a professor of economics at Harvard, wrote a monograph talking about the developmental implications in the South of the family assistance plan. It would have radically transformed economic development and job development in, in the South, where poverty is concentrated. Uh, as Moynihan would say to me, he said, poverty is the greatest in the old Confederacy. That's where it lies. Uh, the other problem, which would have been uh, manageable ultimately, but it was a heck of a thing given the committee jurisdictions in Congress, and different program sponsors, and so on, to mesh, to, to combine this new cash program with the existing poverty assistance type thing. Food stamps being a major one. Do you cash out food stamps? Meaning, you raise the level of the family assistance plan in order so that people no longer need to have food stamps to have an adequate income. To. And then you get into the libertarian issues about, yeah, I like that idea because that gives people a free choice. And others are saying, no, 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 you can't trust people to buy beer. You know? And that's a laboring current argument as well. The, so you have the, the demographic and racial makeup of the recipients of, of assistance from the federal government. You have the question of the mechanics of conversion resistant programs. And then you, you also would have whether it worked or not. <laughs> and there were experiments conducted, uh, the results of which are at the margin. They sound negative to the idea. They sound they were interpreted by the conservatives as being, as saying that fat would not have worked. There were, there were experiments conducted in Seattle and in Denver, and there was one in Trenton, New Jersey. However, there's been some more recent work done by the University of Wisconsin, the economics department, which says that one of the main issues, uh, cannot, the main arguments against fat cannot be supported. The main argument was, well, it didn't help family breakups. In fact, it may have even gone further. The University of Wisconsin analysis of the data says, no, it actually kept family breakup from further deteriorating. And so there's, there will be ongoing arguments. And it was going to be supercharged politically. That would, that would be one of the afterglows of the passage of that. But Reagan, Reagan did not like it. And the conservative movement did not like it. And they, they finally wound up feeling that it was uh, a crucial thing for them to force Nixon to abandon. Does that partially answer your question? Uh, mostly. Okay, what's the rest that I did? <laughs> well, I was thinking of... Is that Mike still? Uh, no, no. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I was thinking sort of on a larger economic scale, like, you know, sort of how would we anticipate the market responding? Like, you know, would bread jump from like two dollars a loaf to six dollars a loaf or something or is that just like complete I'm, i am not the economist I, I can't speculate on that I, I they would have more purchasing power yes and there would be all all kinds of disruptions i mean it would have been the initial reaction of the wallaceites in the south george wallace had been a third party candidate gotten something like 26 or seven electoral college votes barbara Something like that, Large, and over 10% of the world. Uh, but he was foremost, he was a segregationist, but he was a populist. 
and uh, you know he was for the middle person. And when Nixon announced this, one of his cabinet members, who was in Alabama, went down to to visit home, and he came back and he spoke to a meeting I was in, and, and he said, "It's amazing." He said, "All my friends who are Wallace guys, you know, senior managers and fundraisers." He said, they said, you're killing us. What are you doing this for? Because Nixon would have been maybe helping to defuse the racial issue. Because <clears throat> blacks and whites, because they were poor, not because they were in one category or another, would be getting the same the same income supplement. Uh, but it was disruptive. It would have been hugely disruptive. But most major radical social policy changes are social security. Other questions? Oh, George. That's all right. This late relates to contemporary or perhaps future issues. Um, there are some people who speculate that the uh, development of artificial intelligence and robots is going in direction and, and uh, with speed that, say within a generation, we're going to have to have universal basic income because of the loss of jobs, and if all these robots and artificial intelligence are making things, somebody has to be able to buy them. So you might even find industry or uh, the commanders of wealth arguing for some sort of universal basic income because they will have to have that in order for this is the economic society to function. Uh, and indeed, that's happening. And indeed, Jeff Bezos is in favor of universal basic income. And a couple of Silicon Valley uh, figures, I can't recall all of them. Joel Spiegel is very conversant with this, who's an, an alum and a trustee from Seattle and uh, an Amazon guy. Amazon vice president was. And uh, Jamie Dimon, of my old firm, J.P. Morgan, CEO there for a long time, he has come out in favor of the UBI, and they articulate reasons somewhat like you are doing. My comeback to that is what I said in the speech. I said, if you were to do that, depending upon where the level is set, and anything other than you know, a, a laughable level for the true future, the cost, the budget outlay of that would be stupefying. And you combine that with Medicare for all, and, and uh, wonderful. <laughs> Where do we, how do we pay for it? My, my preference still is, you say, there are other routes to that, including much more attention to what education prepares us for in terms of jobs, uh, trying to make sure we have portable, you know, 401ks, and we have portable health insurance policies. There are ways to somewhat alleviate the anguish for the middle income and the the people who would be part occasionally of an economy. I mentioned the gig economy as I was starting my talk. And so on. But my, my profound conviction is that what resources we have, let's think of the need. John, this uh, will ask a question. We get the impression that- I'm sorry, could you give me your name? Oh, sorry, I'm Liz Quitham, I'm a biologist. Um, I, one receives the impression that the kinds of intellectual discussions that you describe are not driving policy today. <laughs> really? Um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, given that, you know, most people pay more attention to tweets than to the New York Times or the Washington Post, you know, how can we generate the kinds of discussions that are necessary to really drive good policy? Well, it's not just this policy, is it? It's Middle East policy, it's uh, you know, education policy, it's anything you want to name. Uh, how do we get people to take it seriously? And I'm, uh, I'm in competition this afternoon with a delightful Canadian uh, professor who is giving a talk on fake news <clears throat> at 4 p.m. Alas, we were sorry we couldn't come to one another. But the point is that, that there's just a, you know, a kaleidoscope of stuff going on out there. It's very hard to, to get people to think. It's hard for us. I have three young kids, 17 and 17. 
they, uh, it's hard for me to get them to think linearly, pulling away from their machines. And uh, I hope we can start there with our own children, you know, get them to think three sentences in a row and look at these things. Um, Moynihan had a phrase which sort of goes to the, the fake news and the, the sort of first transmissions that we're all starting to use. He said, uh, everyone is entitled to their own opinion. No one is entitled to their own facts. And it, it rings true. So, two more questions? I'm sorry. Did, I have no further guidance. Uh, just hopefulness. After all, I'd like to bring out John, thank you uh, for coming today and, and for speaking to this issue. I find it, I did not realize that President Nixon was kind of one of the, the leaders in this conversation. And today, this whole idea of, of income for all, health care for all, all these things are being called socialist. I guess I'm interested in your um, opinion of how to combat that conversation, because this is definitely, in listening to you, not a socialist um, policy. Uh, you, you, uh, of course, you can conflate the socialism and policy with the reaction by the Republicans to Obamacare. And Nixon proposed a health insurance proposal, which included the two things I mentioned, but which also included the employer mandate. Every employer of one or more employees had to provide insurance for their employers, employees. And he also uh, called for the pools of risk, and he was trying to find a way to pay for coverage, for universal coverage. And he didn't tolerate it being called socialist. And the, the enemy then was Ted Kennedy, who was for, in effect, a, uh, uh, you know, a federally sponsored program of health insurance single pair, we call it today. And uh, intriguingly, it's absolutely fascinating, because there was so much politics in it. Nixon knew that Kennedy wanted to run for president, but then after Chappaquiddick, that sort of went away when, when Kennedy's you know, son set after the tragedy involving the death of his staffer, which he ran away from. And uh, Kennedy and Nixon slowly worked their way toward each other. And by winter, at the end of 73 going into 74, the then, sec then Republican Nixon, Secretary of HEW, was a guy named Casper Weinberger. And he had been working on a revival of the Nixon health insurance plan as he did a revival of the FAP. Um, and he got Nixon to talk about openly the possibility of the other candidate. And so, had that happened, it would not have been called socialist. Kennedy was backing away from it. Um, I'm not answering your question well, but uh, the family assistance plan, of course, was radical. I don't know if they were, it was called socialist. The right wing thought of anathema, uh, and it was federal assumption of these things, so that was bad. And I guess they could argue the socialist. <coughs> but the fact of the matter is, Nixon was a conservative who, thanks partly to Moynihan, and Moynihan's put in. Robert Blake's biography of Israeli in front of Nixon, the Tory 19th century British Prime Minister who enacted liberal principles. Nixon was that way. He saw the opposite. Look at Nixon going to China. The hard anti communist guy opens to China. Same way with family assistance. You know, he would say, look, we've, we've got a horrible welfare structure problem. Let's do something about it. So um, call it what you will. It was an attempt by an essentially conservative man and administration, like, if you could say, like FDR in the 1930s, trying to preserve the system by adopting those urgent reforms which would preserve the confidence of the people in the institutions serving them. Thank you so much. This is a fascinating account, and I suspect you might take questions if people have individual ones for you. But again, thanks for coming. Thank you.